Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the book launch of Engraved on Our Nation's Indigenous Economic Tenacity. And thanks so much for joining in. My name is Wanda Wetany. I'm co-editor and your host for this launch. I'd like to share a little bit about myself and how this book came together. After teaching in Native Studies in the uh, department at Na University of Manitoba for 27 years, one of the tools that I didn't see enough of were the resources that celebrate our innovation, our ingenuity as Indigenous peoples, and more importantly, our resilience and tenacity. So this project was born in 2021 to fill that need. This project has been a blessing from the, the beginning. Thank you, Jesus, in every way. We showcase so many wonderful stories of perseverance and the strength, courage, and foresight of Indigenous peoples with examples of real progress all across Canada. I'm so very proud that my daughter, Drew, designed the book cover. We'll take a look right now. And there it is. And um, the picture is of my dad and captures the love, vitality, wisdom, and enduring culture of our people across this great country and their inspiring stories that are shared in this book. Now I would like to introduce my co-editor, Dr. Fred Ween. Fred is the former director of the Maritime School of Social Work at Dalhousie University. We met when Fred served as deputy director of research at the Royal Commission of Aboriginal Peoples in 1992 to 96. His contributions to our nation were recognized with the Order of Canada in 2015, and he's going to share a few words. Fred. Right. Um, well, I, I'm very pleased to join you, and I'm especially pleased to be here on a Zoom link because the last time I was in Winnipeg in the winter time, Wanda took me up to Grand Rapids, which <laughs> is 2,000 kilometers north of Winnipeg. And I think I'm right, Wanda, in saying that it was 40 below, correct? Yeah. Yep. yep. Um, so it was during the course of that trip that I decided I would never again travel with, with Wanda. Uh, but I, I do want to recognize the, the leading role that she has played in putting this book together. Uh, she was the main impetus for it. She worked with a majority of the authors. She wrote several chapters and she did the heavy lifting with the University of Manitoba Press, so so it's been uh, quite a, an accomplishment uh, and a pleasure for me to to work with her. I guess the only thing I would like to say is, you know, why why did we feel it necessary to to uh, develop this uh, manuscript? And it grew out of a sense that a lot of the writing about First Nations, uh, whether it's journalists or whether it's students writing papers or uh, whether it's uh, research studies. Um, the most common pattern has has been to to take a, a deficit perspective to talk about the gaps between First Nations and other Indigenous people in mainstream society to emphasize the uh, inequalities. And, and that's certainly an, an important part of the story, um, but it's really only uh, uh, one aspect of it. Um, I've worked quite a bit with people at the community level who are health directors, let's say, or welfare officers, or economic development officers and and they would frequently say to me that, that they find that emphasis in the writings uh, to be quite discouraging to them because every time they look up someone is telling them you know there are these gaps and and uh, implying that that nothing has changed but here they're they're working very hard to, to make a difference. Um, so it's important to recognize that, uh, not to lose sight of the inequalities that 
continue to exist, but we wanted to make a contribution on another dimension, which is to emphasize the achievements, the successes, uh, as Wanda mentioned, the tenacity and the persistence. And I'm particularly interested to to write a chapter with Chris Gugu where we interviewed people in the Atlantic region who had been recognized as entrepreneurs for their their lifetime achievement. And, and these are people who developed their business, you know, way back in 1950s and 1960s at a time when there weren't very many government programs, but they, they hung in there, they uh, expanded their business, they kept it going, they passed it on to their children, and in many cases, uh, those enterprises that are still going on. So that's just one illustration of the perseverance uh, and creativity that has taken place over the years. And uh, we wanted to make this book available to tell those kinds of stories so that uh, Catherine and Mary Beth and others can use it as a text in their in their classrooms. Thank you so much, Fred. Um, I'd like to introduce our panel. I'm so delighted that some of our contributors are able to join us and share some of the highlights from the work that they have in our book project. First, I'd like to introduce um, David Newhouse. He is Onondaga and professor and longtime director at the Cheney Wenjack School for Indigenous Studies at Trent University in Peterborough, Ontario. His creativity Compassion and dedication have underpinned his excellence as a teacher of Indigenous and non-Indigenous students and has been recognized with the prestigious 3M Fellowship and the Lee Lorch Award from the Canadian Association of University Teachers. Welcome, David. Okay, thanks, Wanda. Thank you. And we also have Mary Beth Doucette, who is Mi'kmaq Canadian from Unamagi, Cape Breton, Nova Scotia, and a member of Member 2 Community. She professionally, she holds PhD and industrial engineering degrees and is associate professor at Cape Breton University Shannon School of Business, where she holds the Purdy Crawford Chair in Aboriginal Business Studies. I'm so glad to have you here, Mary Beth. I'm glad to be here. So we have a missing panel member, and I'm so glad I'm at home because my husband just reached out to him. <laughs> and I'm hoping, what did he say? Oh, he's in a line at the airport. There you go. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so um, let's begin with David. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank, thanks, Wanda. And, and, and thanks, Fred. I mean, for those of you in the class and... and uh, welcome, and also welcome to, to Catherine. It's, it's good to be here. As Wanda said, I'm David Newhouse. Uh, I'm, uh, I just finished a 30-year term as Chair of Native Studies, or Director of the, of the Channing Way Next School for Indigenous Studies, and throughout that entire time, uh, I've been working with Fred and Wanda. And I can't believe that it's now been 30 years since we've, we've known each other, and I've worked together so as well. I want to start, I guess, by, by saying that what we wanted to do with the book was to change the narrative. Fred talked about stories, right? In academic parlance, we talk about narrative, and we live in narratives, and narratives are extremely powerful. And, and so what we want to do is try to tell a very different story. I, I attended the Ivy School of Business back in, uh, in the 1970s. I graduated in 1978. And in 1978-79, I chaired the Ontario Indian Loan Advisory Board. And that year we received a grand total of four applications for loans from Indian people, as we used the term back then, uh, in Ontario. 
There are now about 60,000 indigenous small businesses right across the country, according to, to Stats Canada. So things have, have changed, and, and that change did not occur uh, by itself. It did not occur overnight. It occurred as a result of a long-term determined effort by indigenous leaders to take the reins of community development and begin to put their own ideas on the table and to begin to use those ideas as a open for strategies. And as indigenous people, we have been following the same strategy now for 40 years. And since we're now in Manitoba, right, I want to uh, at least pay homage to Manitoba because without Manitoba, we would not be where we are today. And without the Manitoba chiefs, we would not be where we are today. In 1971, the Manitoba uh, Indian Brotherhood right, uh, put out a paper called Wabung, Our Tomorrows. And what it was, was a development strategy. It was a strategy that came up from the indigenous communities, articulated by indigenous leaders, uh, presented to government, and was adopted by indigenous leaders across the country as the way in which we ought to develop our communities. And so what the plan said was we, we have to have a comprehensive plan. Government at that point had, had, uh, had small piecemeal approaches to development. And Wabung said, Manitoba Indian chief said, that's not the way that we see things. We want to take a comprehensive approach. And they set out a plan that had three elements. They said, we're poor, and we have to find a way to recover from the effect of poverty and the effect of powerlessness. So we have to focus upon in individual healing and community healing, and we need uh, health service and community infrastructures. So the very first element of the economic development strategy was one that focused upon healing, focused upon health. You have to be healthy in order to engage in economic activity. Secondly, is that we need to uh, have land and we need to have resources, we need to have people, uh, and that we need to have a plan for ensuring that our interests in our lands are protected, that we can use our lands in ways that we see fit. And that meant to a large extent a, a, a advocating for a process to begin the process of, of land claims. And it also meant that uh, we also had to begin to think about treaties. And uh, treaties become very important. And, and we're in a period of time in which the government of Canada is saying treaties are not important, they're relics of the past. And indigenous leaders said no, they are living documents. And there's not just the words, there's the spirit and intent behind them. And we need to ensure that we use these treaties uh, as a way of developing our communities. And lastly, they said, we need also to develop our own people. We need to educate our people. We need to uh, develop our human resources. And we need to protect and develop our cultures. There's cultural and development, our ability to engage in our cultural activities are foundational to any form of economic and community development. And so coming out of Manitoba is this incredible strategy, this incredible statement about what it is that we think needs to be done. And we, in this case, is indigenous, or is indigenous people. Back then we talked of Indians and, and, and Métis. And, and today we talk of uh, Indigenous, First Nation, uh, Métis, and Inuit. And so we're now talking of a much more inclusive approach to the development that covers all of the Aboriginal people in Canada. And so I wanted to, 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 to acknowledge the work that chiefs in Manitoba did at the very beginning, because they, to a large extent, set things in motion. 
that allowed all of our creativity, all of our innovation, all of the work that came. We talk about development institutions, and we have now, 50 years later, an enormous infrastructure of institutions. Wanda and I are writing about them in a report that will come out right, for the uh, part of the National Indian Economic Development Board progress reports. They're capital corporations. There have been uh, incredible changes in legislation, incredible changes in law, incredible changes in attitudes towards indigenous economic development, both inside our communities and outside our communities. And it's important to acknowledge that we are following the same basic strategy and we've been following it for 50 years. And that to me is tenacity. I'm always reminded of our determination as I look back and I see right, the Nishka who negotiated the treaty for 117 years. That is determination, that is tenacity, and they managed to get a new treaty and be recognized as a nation. They didn't get everything they wanted, but that's the nature of politics. And so what we see when we begin to look at our communities and our development areas through the lens of tenacity and determination, we see an incredible, incredible uh, set of activities and incredible developments. And we have a foundation that is going to take us into the future. And it's all been, all been led by Indigenous people with the assistance of government and, uh, and Indigenous leaders have worked with governments and brought governments around to understanding how we see development and begin to shape programs so that they can support our communities and our economies. The, Canada, the uh, Bank of Canada now says that the Indigenous economy is worth about $40 billion per year, that it contributes about 1.5% of the gross uh, domestic product as well. That would have been un, a, an unheard of statement in 1978. And that is the, the legacy of entrepreneurs who are uh, to a large to a large extent the backbone of any economy as well. And we see a new generation of, uh, of entrepreneurs begin to appear I was looking to, uh, and I'm supervising a young student who was looking at TikTok and TikTok entrepreneurs are incredible in what they are managed to achieve in, uh, in, in, in their work as well. So it's not just economic, but it's also cultural and it's also change in the way in which others see us as well. So that's the message of the book. That's the message that we're trying to get across. We're trying to create a very different story and trying to change the story and we're trying to help have others understand us in ways that are uh, moving way past deficit so i think i'm running out of time so thank you very much okay wanda i can talk for hours i think on this but <laughs> thank you so much david and maybe you could stop sharing yes i will do that <laughs> that was lovely thank you so much um, the introduction that you wrote for us is um, so inspiring to see, you say, the long history that's there and not really well known. So thank you for that. So Mary Beth, on to you. Okay, let's see if I can. I usually use Teams, so I'm just going to see if I can get the sharing working here. Okay, so you see my slides now? Yes. Great, all right. Um, okay, so thank you, Walaliok. Thank you for creating this space for us to talk about the book today. Um, I love listening to David talk about all the things that he's been he's been working on. I really wish some of the things he's working on this year had maybe been published last year or the year before, so I could have just referenced them <laughs> in my thesis and not had to go through all the 
the things that he's been he's been talking about lately and find them my, on my own but anyhow such is such is life that's the way timing works um so i'm really happy to be able to be here today to share from chapter the chapter in the book that uh, fred and i wrote um and so i will start by reading a little bit from this from this chapter uh, it starts off by saying that uh, first nations communities are starting uh, to come into their own again as um as David was talking about. Um, after three centuries of resisting colonial pressure to adapt to European standards uh, and accept modern colonial ideas, many First Nations from coast to coast to coast have become economic change leaders, practicing self-determination, um, practicing self-determination, which is increasing their success. And so, as Wanda and and um, Jerry suggested in their final chapter of this of this book, indigenous economic development is not a one sided transformation. As indigenous economies adapt and transform, so too must those who are co located in the spaces they inhabit, as participants in various social and cultural networks locally and nationally. Um, and I read that because when I was invited to work on this chapter with uh, Fred um, and he wanted to write a case study of member two for the book, we wanted um, to discuss and understand how this relatively small community of member two located on the Atlantic coast of Canada has garnered so much uh, significant attention, both regionally and, and globally. And so in our chapter, we say that member, the member two case reflects the central notions of indigenous thought discussed throughout the book. As the Mi'kmaq community that in the past has faced serious socioeconomic issues, member two has increasingly built a thriving economic base while constantly reinvesting in efforts to build toward the community's goals of self-determination. And we further recognize that um, over the past number of decades, numerous academic papers had been um, written, uh, multiple research papers had been documenting the economic decisions and strategies that uh, people believe that were leading to member two's success um, and perhaps their influential and perhaps enviable uh, economic position. Um, and so that's what we were investigating in this book. And the pictures that I'm showing on the slides, this slide, the next couple um, of slides, are pages from Member 2's 2019 2020 annual report. And I brought these up because this was the year that we were conducting the interviews, was in 2019. So it was before the pandemic. It's taken a little while to get published, but it's been, it was before the pandemic. Um, and in this case study, we were highlighting narratives of resilience and tenacity that are reflected in the voices of member two staff. Uh, we suggest that the resilience of the member two community has allowed it to survive a very challenging history for more than a century. Um, and that the ongoing displays of resilience and tenacity exhibited by the current chief, Chief Terry Paul, um, and those who work with him, have led to a transition from high levels of poverty and unemployment to and welfare and uh, welfare dependence to being a community with strong self-reliant economic base on a reserve. Uh, but when we were preparing this chapter, we recognized that First Nations approaches historically, as um, we were talking about with the book, were rarely framed as model models of community economic development with with wider applicability. So only rarely if you're talking about Aboriginal communities and the way they're doing economic development, would you hear about the models as something that other Canadian communities or other communities beyond Canada might learn from? And so in our chapter, um, we expand on the exploration of the member to model by looking at the community, not as a standalone entity, but as part of a larger community of communities. Um, and we recognize that the kinds of transformation displayed in the member two case 
also required a transformation of the relationships in the community and the relationships that it has with others who live in the surrounding areas. And so the efforts to expand the economic base at Member 2 also changed local social perceptions about Indigenous communities, and they had to change those perceptions if it was going to continue to be successful. So in our chapter, alongside the voices of the Member 2 staff, we included voices of their partners from the local uh, wider surrounding region. And we, we asked the question and consider how non-Indigenous partners, leaders working in the Cape Breton Regional Municipality, describe Member 2's transformation and its impacts and the impacts it's had on the various local relationships, whether they be social, political, or economic. And so what did people tell us about this transition? Well, from the analysis, which we used a mixed methods approach uh, where our analysis drives on both primary and secondary qualitative and quantitative analysis, we tried to provide a sense of the economic context. So on this slide, you see a couple of periods of change. Um, we were referring to previously published studies that had been published in the 1990s and early 2000s, and we include uh, data from published policy documents, academic literature, and statistical data. But at the same time, we also wanted to consider this data in relationship to um, the information and opinions that were provided to us by semi-structured interviews. And again, they were carried out in July and August 2019. Um, and so, we wanted to show the period of change to understand that the transition to the success that uh, Member 2 is heralded for now did not take place over a short period of time. It was an extended time of change. Um, and we was it started as early as um, before the 1970s. Many of the interviewees that we talked to recalled memories from their youth from the 1970s and the 1980s when Mi'kmaq and settler Canadians did not interact frequently. And so our interviewees looked at member two from the outside, they would say that they rarely gave the community much thought. While physically located within the city of Sydney's limits or the boundaries, member two was not seen as part of the municipal structure. And although the reserve was located right in the middle of downtown, because it was located on crown land and governed through provisions set out on the Indian Act, they were a completely separate community. Um, several of the interviewees also reported that they had little reason to visit the community. Uh, and I'll quote one of those by saying, um, I would have to say that the perception at the time and probably in the early, 19, uh, early 1980s was that Member 2 was a community outside of Sydney, more or less, a community that was in not decline so much as poverty, and it really didn't have a lot going for it. And so that was a uh, Cape Breton public servant. And the reason why he was distinguishing between not being in decline was because um, the rest of the surrounding Cape Breton region was in decline at the time. They had seen this kind of boom cycle, and then they were heading into a bus cycle. So a lot of the narratives of the local non-Mi'kmaq community were talking about economic decline and how do we mitigate and manage that. We contrast that quote with another quote from a member two public servant. Um, and he said, member two has become a place where everyone knows someone that works in member two or at least that it is benefiting from a member two initiative. And they're okay with it now. People are less concerned about the competition between the Mi'kmaq community and the CBRM and more grateful for all of the opportunities our developments have provided. I feel a lot more acceptance and you see it in people's comments. For example, they often say we should, hi uh, we should have Chief Terry run for mayor. And so in our chapter, we evaluated some of the, the impacts, uh, which are highlighted on this slide. People told us in the interviewees, uh, people told us in the interviews uh, about the direct and indirect impacts of the work that was done. 
Um, they talked about Member 2 as an activity center, as an innovation catalyst, making investments outside of the community, as well as uh, making investments that support community growth. They talk about economic impacts, the multiple social investments that Member 2 makes in the surrounding community, the strategic influence that it has with political leaders and corporate leaders, as well as we, they spoke of um, some of the ongoing controversy. Um, for example, what is the most reasonable explanation of members to success? Is it the location? Is it the people? Is it a leader, a government policy? And so we proposed in our chapter that um, perhaps it's because of a different model of government a governance and decision making that member two um, has been so successful. Um, member two, we suggest, demonstrates a different approach to governance and decision making. Um, we summarize the essence of this approach by highlighting four features. They create partnerships and bring people together. They seek consensus or at least keep many of the disagreements within the community. Um, the optimism and the can-do attitude and the encouraging young people to strive for success is a key feature of Member 2's approach, as well as the emphasis on higher standards, sophistication, and the need for continual uh, improvement. And so I was really grateful to have the opportunity to share what I've learned about Member 2 in these interviews. Um, it is a community that I am part of and that I've also worked for. And I was also grateful to hear from the voices of the local leaders who were quite candid in a lot of the interviews uh, that we did and candid with their comments. And so in the interest of time, I'm going to uh, end with one of the quotes that's towards the end of our chapter. It's a non-Mi'kmaq municipal leader who said, I think the most important thing about Member 2 is that it's hopeful. It's hopeful, and most people have no idea what the hell is going on up there, but it's hopeful, you know? It's, it's just really fascinating. And so I hope that people who read this book, who read this chapter and other chapters, are inspired to ask people how Indigenous economic development change and changes and impacts them as well. Um, and so with that, I say, Willalia, thank you for your time, um, and I'll hand it back to... Wanda. Thank you so much, Mary Beth. Um, reading that chapter is just so inspiring because, again, it's stories that aren't necessarily shared um, widely, although you said it's it's that's been changing. And it's just so wonderful to have that story as part of uh, this book project. So I'd like to introduce Catherine Davis. She is Métis and the instructor for an MBA class, and she is our host for this book launch. And I just really am very grateful for her enthusiasm to uh, host us. And she's going to be dealing with um, the questions that her students have for us. Right, Tanse, welcome. And uh, thank you so much. I'm happy to see that I think there's about uh, 85 people joining us here online, and we have another 31 here in our classroom. So I really appreciate all of the hard work and dedication and tenacity of our panelists and our co-editors. It's really, really showing and shifting the narrative, as you said, around um, and even within our class, you know, talking about the past, talking about the current legacy and challenges, but moving forward to the future. How can economic reconciliation look in Canada? And so all of the cases that you've, uh, and I look forward to reading more in, in future, um, but uh, I, I do have a few questions here. So um, I think just because of how David uh, and, and Mary Beth were speaking there, uh, Mary Beth, you kind of said uh, that you wish you could speak more to some of the projects that David's working on. And so, David, what are some of these things you're working on lately? Uh, as, as you mentioned, this was done in 2019. So, and then there's been a pandemic. You know, what do we have to look forward to and some of the new projects you're working on? I guess there, there, I, I can talk about two things, right? The, the first one is a, a paper that Wanda and I are working on. Right, which is uh, put in the detail to the development of economic institutions that have occurred 
over the last, uh, in particular, 25 years or so. And, and, and uh, now we're looking at economic development corporations, Aboriginal capital corporations. We're looking at, uh, at uh, business and economic sector associations. So we're trying to document all of the institutions that we have developed in order to provide a support foundation for the development of our communities. So that's the first project. And, and I was admit, I was very surprised when I began to look at the dates of the startup of many of the institutions that we have, right? They're 30 years old, right? 40 years old. So I was very surprised to, to see that. I mean, I thought they were relatively new phenomenon, and most of them are, but there is a core group of, of, of capital corporations, economic development organizations that uh, have been on the ground now for three decades. And so that's, that's what we're trying to do and trying to show that, right, as well. The, the other piece that I'm working on independent of Wanda is I'm looking at indigenous knowledge and economic development. And when I listened to Mary Beth speak and answer the question, uh, why member two? What is happening member two? And she put that last chart up, right? And, and if you can put it up again, Mary, Mary Beth, that would be great. Because what, what I saw in what Mary Beth put up and what member two is doing is operating uh, using indigenous knowledge. And, and you know, I, I, I teach my students that uh, the heart of indigenous culture is this idea of cooperation, is this idea of trying to find ways to come together, trying to find ways to come together for common purpose. And so when I look at what Mary Beth has presented, I look at it through the lens of indigenous knowledge. And I see that our values, our approaches are not absent, that they're present. And so that's what I'm trying to, to do, is also to show how economic development is informed by our own values, our own uh, system of knowledge, our own understandings of, of, of the world, right, as well. And, and, and how we're beginning to develop and shape our economies so that they reflect our understandings of, of the world as well. And I've been, I, I, the, the, I, I gave a talk to a group of business students this morning on, on, on this topic, which is why it's top of the mind right now, okay, as well, so. So that's what I'm doing, and I think, that, I think that's important to show, right, that, that despite all of the pressures of colonialism, that our values, our beliefs about the world are still very much alive. And they're embedded in language, and that language is, is beginning to come back again as well. So, and so I see member two as a, a good example of how to do this. So. All right, thank you so much. So uh, my next question is for uh, Mary Beth. So um, there, there's this narrative throughout, as you've all mentioned, kind of shifting from this deficit model to more of a contribution model. And, um, you know, there's this all too common narrative of Indigenous communities needing to build capacity. Um, and as you've all shared that there's been efforts for decades, very Indigenous led um, and partnerships have formed uh, with Corporate Canada and, and um, Indigenous communities and um, Indigenous businesses. So what's the capacity that must be built within Corporate Canada? to be partner ready to work with indigenous communities uh like member two or the other cases that are um, shared within uh, your book oh mary beth you're muted that's an excellent question um it's a question i get asked quite frequently lately um and it's a question, quite honestly, that uh, I think we are starting to see member two um, consider in a real way, since especially since the purchase of Clearwater. Like, I think member two has been doing this for a long time, 
thinking, you know, like, okay, well, we're going to partner with other people. And a lot of their partnerships, and, and Fred might have some, some insight into this as well, a lot of the partnerships have been political in nature over the years. It's been about good relationships, the, the themes that we highlighted, like bringing people together, being forthright about, you know, like, this is what we're aiming for. This is how you can support us. And this is when we're going to be will willing to work with you. Like, it's not just because as some of the interviews, when we were talking, they're like, well, Ch Chief Terry has a lot of political clout. So he can call Minister X and ask him for something, or he can call this other person because of who Chief Terry is, which there's some truth to that. But when we talked to people who have been working in member two in the executive senior executive leader leadership team, they're like, what people really tell us they appreciate most is just that when we come to the table, we're honest. We tell them what to expect. We're not trying to manipulate them in any way. We're trying to work with them in an honest way. And we do set a really high standard of expectation. So um, I think that working with corporate people to understand what's happening in Indigenous communities. It's a lot of it's the education piece around history now. It's like, yeah, okay, Member 2 is a great partner and Indigenous communities can be great partners to work with. Um, kind of going to start rambling. So bring me back to the question if I start rambling too much. I think that what we're looking at now with Member 2, Member 2 is, well, the Mi'kmaq Consortium purchased uh, Clearwater and they're now starting to really grapple with the human resources and what does it mean to have um, a non-Indigenous corporation that's going to now embody the community, like it already exists. It's a colonial institution that does fishing and we're gonna come in and try and Indigenize, but the leadership team of member two is the one that's making the changes. And so there's a lot of new questions that I think they're coming up with around capacity and what does it mean to build capacity and does capacity building in this context mean the same thing as it does when we're talking about social development and all the rest of it. Um, and so, yeah, I think, I think a lot of the capacity building is around history and understanding where our biases are quite honestly. Um, in the business school, we talk a lot about human resources and needing to understand racism and the source of racism and then anti-racist training, like just knowing all of those pieces, I think is, is the most important thing right now. But that's just my personal opinion because I come up against it a lot and others might have some other thoughts about that. Right. Thank you. Any yeah. other contributions or thoughts from panelists yeah. or editors? You know, when Mary Beth and I were doing the interviews, uh, a lot of the questions had to do with, you know, what impact does Member 2 have on the wider Cape Breton region? And um, for much of it, I don't think we were too surprised. You know, we knew that Member 2 was providing a lot of jobs, not only for Member 2 residents, but also for people in the surrounding area. Uh, we knew about contracts to service people and, and construction projects and charitable giving and, and so on. But this thing that we've been uh, focusing on in the last few minutes, uh, that was a surprise to me to hear uh, leaders in the Cape Breton area uh, talk about their perception that uh, decision making and leadership at member two was different and not only different but they would compare it with you know how decisions are made in the Cape Breton regional municipality and they would say you know we wish we were closer to the to the member two model I guess the other thing I would point out and this gets at David's question about, you know, why member two, uh, why was it successful in, in making this transition um, and going beyond the quality of leadership? I think uh, stability of leadership is a very important uh, consideration. And it's particularly difficult to achieve in the First Nation context because the Indian Act has required, you know, an election every two years, right? And so leadership often changes and 
people aren't in office long enough for for longer range planning. But at member two, Mary Beth, I think Chief Terry has been chief since the mid 1980s, correct? So he's been elected every two years um, for a very long time. And now the term is, is four or five years, but but I think that uh, that has made a, a difference uh, for a member too. I'm just thinking about um, the comments too about not only corporate Canada being involved, but also partnering with um, multi levels of government. So I'm thinking of the case study that we have on um, uh, the the Federation of Canadian Municipalities with um, First Nation communities and partnering, uh, bringing those partnerships uh, uh, some resources to the table, but. Um, that conversation started before the uh, this government program, um, it's SETI, Community Economic Development Initiatives, and it's um, a project that's been going on for a number of years that support these kind of, of uh, coming together of First Nation communities with municipalities. Uh, but the conversation started earlier in the Canadian Federation of Municipalities about how they could reach out to uh, the, their neighbors, their Indigenous community neighbors, and they didn't know how to do it. And so from what I gathered, um, I think it's the same thing with Corporate Canada. It's being respectful. It's understanding that, you know, um, while things are different, there's also commonalities and there's wonderful ways to build on those commonalities and have a win-win situation for everybody. Um, I know uh, some of the comments from uh, some of the leaders was, I didn't know what I didn't know. Uh, they hadn't been at the table together before that, although they might be neighbors. And um, yeah, so I'm thinking that respect and understanding that it's like any, any um, new relationship, you have to take time uh, with it. You have to not skip over building trust and not be in a rush to sign on the dotted line, um, that's a huge part of the process that they promote as well. So I think there's some ap applicability as well. Uh, Wanda, I, I agree. The, the big challenge, though, with the Federation of Canadian Municipalities is that they completely ignore the urban Indigenous population. Their program is focused upon First Nation and relationship with adjacent First Nations or contiguous First Nations. And, and, and they ignore the fact that 60% of Indigenous people now live in urban environments. They, they do have um, partnerships that aren't contiguous. And I agree. I think that the funding uh, has not, uh, the parameters of the federal government funding have not aligned with the reality. And I agree with you, yeah, urban, also Métis and yeah. Inuit. Um, but their funding is very focused, so it's been a platform, but it's definitely, there's room for improvement. I mean, there are limitations to a distinction-based approach, right? And it doesn't work very well in urban environments as well, right? And, and so you know, that's an issue, I think, that we have to address over the next uh, few years or so, right, as well. You know, the National Association of French Centers has had two innovation conferences this year. Right, and, and at the one in November, there were probably about uh, 200 people who showed up to talk about social enterprises and demonstrate the innovation, the creativity of Indigenous people living in urban environments. They had another conference at the end of February, again, focusing again, in this case, upon creativity and innovation specifically, and about, again, about 150 people showed up right to these. And so I, I think if we're going to reach out to corporate Canada and partner with corporate Canada, we also have to show, we also have to educate corporate Canada to see us in positive terms. And the elders in, in our communities here in Peterborough and, and Ontario say that you have to begin to change the story. You can't build upon a deficit. You have to look for the strengths. And you have to build upon the strengths. And so we have to present our strengths, right, to 
corporate Canada. And we have to show that we're more than just the, our problems. And member two is a, an excellent example of, of, uh, of that, right, as well. But we have to do that as, as Indigenous academics and as, as leaders and as non-Indigenous allies. That's the job that we have to do, right, as well. I mean, why, why would Corporate Canada partner with us if all they see is deficit? So, Catherine, I know this is where Anne's spending a lot of time answering this one question. <laughs> if you have other questions, we should move on. But I do want to say, just to build on uh, David's point, one of the things uh, that I would encourage, you know, like corporate Canada and all all leaders in, you know, like Canada to be very aware of and deliberate of is to understand the language, like the implications of the language that they're using and in different regions. So a one size fits all approach is not going to work. What ha works in member two um, is not necessarily going to work everywhere else. I learned this in class when I'm teaching my students and they're like, well, we can't member two chief and council and chief Terry's the CEO and you can't, you have to have a separation between politics and, and government. Uh, politics and economics and and that wouldn't work in member two there's a reason why chief terry is both the ceo and the 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 chief it's the way that the community supports him that might not work in saskatchewan and it might not work in in other provinces and other nation nations um but also to the language because i've done some some research on this um Corporate Canada uses different words. Like partnership is not the word that they use to describe most of their relationships with Indigenous communities or Indigenous development corporations. They would prefer to use words like stakeholder or rights holder or um, or beneficiary or you know, like there's all of these words that they would use that shapes the relationship and their understanding of why they're talking to an indigenous community so i'd be very you know, like just attentive to the words that we're using and then what does that imply in terms of the relationship that you're you're working on and developing great thank you that speaks specifically to a conversation we had about you know shareholder primacy versus stakeholder theory versus rights holder and versus a true partnership and that progression and how trust and relationships are needed. Um, and really what I'm hearing from everyone, um, just that capacity to be actually ready to have a conversation with Indigenous communities. And I think, um, you know, that always hasn't been that preparedness um, in understanding what terms and interests need to be discussed to see the benefits and opportunities of working with Indigenous people and communities and nations. Um, so I could I could ask so many questions. I could spend, I'd love to spend so much more time with everyone, but just being mindful of the time, um, I, I just think maybe to leave off with um, perhaps uh, hopeful advice, since that's, a, that's uh, the quote that that you ended with Mary Beth around hope. Um, and so just building on this contributions model, what is the useful tool that you really found from this book um, and the way that uh, this tool can help change the approach to economic, Indigenous economic development? So um, just kind of giving words of encouragement for our audience and what's kind of that one tool, I know it's gonna be hard, but to really concretely say what's uh, to to leave our audience here uh, feeling hopeful. So uh, it'd be great to hear from from everyone uh, briefly as we wrap up here. So maybe we'll start with uh, start with Wanda. Thank you, Catherine. I don't think I could do it in one one tool. Um, This story, I don't think, um, has, is something that's commonly understood. And so I think when I was thinking on all of the contributions to this book, and thank you, University of Manitoba Press, for seeing the value of this project, um, it really was, as Mary Beth said, it, the, the stories are unique. Um, there are wonderful 
examples of the challenges faced and understanding that, yeah, sometimes we get stuck, but a lot of times there's stories where we don't get stuck and what do those look like? So understanding that, yeah, you may see, you know, a problem, but if you talk with us um, and understand where we've come from and where we're planning on going, uh, you might be surprised, pleasantly surprised, wonderfully surprised, uh, because there is this vision, this wonderful vision. And I think that's a common thread throughout all of the contributions to this project. Uh, you don't stop at the problems, as David said. Uh, you keep, th there's a lot of really positive things happening. Mary Beth talked about accountability and transparency. I mean, that's becoming a more common uh, story across this country when you talk to leaders uh, about what what they're doing and how they're meeting the needs of their communities, um, understanding what um, what strengths they have and taking those to the table. And uh, if we would have heard from Jerry Asp, who was also going to be part of this panel in Talton Nation, that's another story on the opposite coast from Member Two of starting uh, with really huge um, problems and how they took control, how they decided that this is our vision for our community and this is what's gonna happen and we want partners, but this is the way that we're gonna do it. Those stories are becoming more common and they're so inspiring. So, sorry, probably probably just didn't come no. up with one tool, but it is so much, so much hope, so, so um, hopeful for, not only our communities, not only for those in the urban uh, communities, but uh, for all of Canada. Like this is a success story for all of Canada. Thank you. So I'm just going to briefly mention before we get to the other few people to answer the question uh, that you can see here. I don't know if you're gonna see it backwards <laughs> maybe, but engraved 30 is the promo code for the book for to receive 30%. So. I'll say that again at the end, but uh, I'll turn it now to uh, Fred. Do you want to, in just a short uh, summary of what to leave people hopeful with here? I'm good on short, Catherine. So uh, I think if people go through the different chapters in the book, I think one uh, thing that they will learn is to appreciate the diversity of uh, different initiatives. Uh, you know, I mentioned the old timers uh, as one example. We have an article on a uh, cooperative approach to working with uh, people who are still trapping for a living. Uh, and on the other side, uh, we have accounts of people working in urban areas on really major development projects with uh, very complicated relationships with municipalities and planning exercises and, and so on. So so I think that's one of the lessons coming from the book. Okay, um, I'm just going in order here. Mary Beth, do you have one final um, message to bring hope? Yeah, so I... Um... I would really encourage people to just foster genuine curiosity as much as possible um, when you start hearing information. So go do your reading in this class. I'm sure you're reading lots of things um, and then ask questions. But like, well, why? Why did that? Why? Why did they say it that way? <laughs> like, be curious and genuinely curious. Um, because if you're asking people from a, you know, like a place where you actually want to hear the answer and listen to the answer, um, you'll learn all kinds of things. Um, and along that vein, I would say the other thing is keep coming back. Like, don't be afraid to look like a fool. And if you do embarrass yourself or you feel embarrassed after interacting with somebody, don't be afraid to come back and and continue the conversation because I think so many people that I talk to are afraid they're like oh I don't want to I don't want to offend somebody and I don't want to do it wrong and I'm just going to like not it's worse to do something wrong than it is to like make an effort um and I 
I don't think that's the right approach. So I would say, you know, like ask good questions, be genuinely curious. And if you're coming forward with a, like a good heart, then keep coming back and people will appreciate that. Uh, and David, can you uh, just send us off here with a hopeful message from the book that you're, you'd like people to walk away with? The book is a set of stories of, of, of achievement, right? And uh, if you're going to work with us, then ask us what we want. Ask us what we're trying to achieve. And then listen and listen deeply to what we're trying to achieve and try to find ways in which you can, you can assist, that you can help as well. And there are all sorts of ways in which one can, can help as well. Well, we're uh, at time here, so I'll, I'll leave Wanda with just closing off here. And just a reminder again to go purchase the book. It's on pre-order. It comes out March 29th. And again, I don't know if this is backwards or not, but engraved 30 for 30% off. So it's not backwards. You're you're all good. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And actually, we just heard the book is in today. So that's awesome. And yeah, so everybody will be getting their copies and be able to um, order. Uh, University of Manitoba Press, it's just been such a wonderful um, engagement with all of the people that were able to make it. And thank you so much for um, joining in. I really appreciate it and look forward to hearing some good feedback. Let us know what you think. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank Yay, you. students. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, hey, thank you everyone. We'll have the recording up uh, for both of you as well. So thanks. Thank We're done. Thanks. Bye. Bye, Wanda. Bye, Fred. Bye, Catherine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.